Politics, business, and religion. We discuss the topics you avoid at the dinner table, bringing you the biggest names in Texas politics and beyond. This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. We are honored to have in our studio today State Senator Carol Alvarado, who hails from Senate District 6 in Houston. Welcome, Senator. Hi, Trey. Thanks Thank for, you for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. So, you and I have known each other for a long time because you served about 10 years. Right. Is that the official number? 10 years in the Texas House. Uh, and then this opportunity arose for you to run for the Senate seat. Uh, tell our audience how that came about and why you decided to take that leap. Well, it started, gosh, December of 2017 uh, when Congressman Gene Green, who I worked for at one time, right. announced his retirement. And uh, then State Senator Sylvia Garcia was a candidate for that, and um, she, she won. That was anticipated that she would win. And so it was very odd because it was like I was on this long marathon assuming she would win. Mm -hmm. She was the favorite. And then once she won, then the governor called the election very quick. So it was like, oh, wow. It was like a marathon and then a quick sprint. Right. To right. The wait, 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 go. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we won uh, very handedly. We won without a runoff, and uh, we we were sworn in before the other freshmen. So okay, I think so. Pat Fallon has, has an issue with talk that. Talk to that camera yeah, when you Pat say that. Fallon, if you're listening, <laughs> they know you're still really upset and bothered by that, but too bad. Tough, tough, Pat. <laughs> um, so for, for our audience and our listeners who don't understand the significance, you and I get the significance of you getting sworn in before everybody else, but explain to everybody else why that's important. Well, I jumped ahead of all the other freshmen in seniority. Right. So everybody had already picked out their offices and their place on the floor. And so I asked Patsy, I said, well, since I'm going to be official sooner mm -hmm. than they are, do I get to jump ahead? Right. And she said, yeah, you do. So I exercised that. Yes, as you <laughs> should have. And uh, yeah, we had to get someone else had the office that we were moved to. And you had to push him out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a place on the floor. Okay. So yeah, maybe that's why Pat's not. Oh, well, he'll get over it. He'll get over it. And, and so seniority, which means you get to pick your desk on the floor first, you get to pick your office before they get to pick their office. And what I've always thought was most important, especially when I was a staffer, is parking spaces. Parking, yeah. That's important. And I walk to work, so <laughs> my chief of okay. staff has a very nice parking space. Oh, yeah, that's very <laughs> kind of you. Yeah. Very kind of you. So you were born and raised in Houston, is that right? Right, in the east end of Houston, Houston community. Where'd you go to school? I graduated from Milby High School, Go Buffs, and my undergrad and graduate were from the University of Houston, Go Cougs. Yesterday was Cougar Day. I uh, saw that. They were yes, all we over had the Capitol. Our Chancellor, Dr. Couture, who I admire, and she's done a lot for the university. We're Tier 1 now. We're very close to getting a medical school right. and maybe a new uh, building for the law school. And um, so she and the, our chair of the board, uh, Tillman Fertitta, were in town. And so it was red cougar day all day yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I always love watching the groups come to the Capitol. And, and you know, I guess I've, I've been around the business for a long time, so have you. And I think it's easy for some of us who walk in and out of that building every day to not pause to take in the majesty of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really wonderful uh, when folks come in with different groups, teachers groups, farmers groups, university groups, yeah. and e especially the kids who come in and they're just in awe of that massive pink granite building. And it, and it, it does make you stop and, and appreciate it a little you more. You know, it's funny you bring that up because I was thinking about that today as I was leaving the, the floor of the Senate and there were people in there and you could just hear them kind of, gasp when they came in and I'm thinking you know I need to take time and really appreciate you know, we have all these mm -hmm. paintings on the walls and um, you know I, until now I'd never noticed that there's a beautiful painting of Barbara Jordan there right and so I took a picture of that the day that I was sworn in before Pat Palin anyway. <laughs> 
Not that they're not that he cares, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there, there's remarkable history there. So I'm going to make it a point to try to capture something every day that I'm mm -hmm. on the floor. I think that's great. Um, so you got a degree in business administration, also, right? right? I got my MBA from the Bauer College of Business. Very, very uh, sought after uh, program mm -hmm. at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And undergraduate in political science. Right. But your entire life, you've clearly had a, a, a pull towards public service. Right. Why is that? Well, yeah, you know, Trey. I grew up in a neighborhood that was challenged by many things. It's a low-income neighborhood, um, really enclosed by railroad tracks mm. and a lot of industry, a lot of environmental clean air issues and uh, transportation issues, getting in and out of the neighborhood mm. because the trains were always blocking. And so it, it kind of like sparked my interest to want to make a change, to make a difference, to get results. And so at a very young age, I started organizing my neighborhood and taking on everybody well, that was when, a problem. <laughs> when, when you say young, are you talking 8 or 18? No, no, like 18. <laughs> okay. I think 18 is young. But um, yeah, as a teenager, I started. Right. We didn't have a civic club, so I started a civic club. And then I started inviting elected officials to the meetings. And they mm. would come because I could easily get two to three hundred people wow. at our meetings. Right, so they're going I, to come. I made my own flyers and I would go door to door and put on there, you know, we're going to talk about the, the air quality in the neighborhood. We're going to talk right. about the, the trains that are you know, stopped for a long period of time on the tracks and blocking us. And, um, and then I ran for precinct chair. So mm. I really started the political process in elected office at the very, very bottom, at the very grassroots right. level. And I think that's a, it's an, definitely an advantage because it gives you, a, I think, a greater appreciation for what community and people on the grassroots level do Absolutely. as part of the political process. Right. And then I later was chair of our Senate district. Uh, I guess that's kind of funny that now I'm actually the senator. Oh, well, it's been a fascinating progression, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. So you did that, and then... Yeah, city, I was on city council. I worked for uh, Mayor Lee Brown, who was the first African-American mayor, so it was kind of a, a historical point for the city of Houston. And I think, even to this day, that was one of my best jobs, because mm. I had a portfolio of issues that have made a lasting impact on the city of Houston. I was his liaison to Metro. So I worked on us getting the first rail line down Main Street. And oh, that wow. in itself was controversial because um, people on the other side of the aisle, even though city council is nonpartisan, right. they were against it. And so there were many lawsuits. People didn't want rail. Huh. And um, as you see now, we have rail going all over the city. Eventually, we'll get it out to the airports. And uh, I was his liaison to the Sports Authority, where we uh, I sat in negotiations with, uh, with the mayor and the owner of the Rockets and got the uh, Toyota Center built. Nice. And, uh, and then NRG Stadium as well, and worked on with departments like the parks department, solid ways, health, uh, various labor organizations. The, the core functions that are really important oh, to people that oftentimes yeah, get overlooked, right? Up, yeah. You can't go to the parks. I mean, you're you're not going to last. That's very right. Long. So it was. It's been a nice journey, and you know, I I, I like the way I approached it, which was starting at the bottom and going to the different levels and then coming here to the legislature. So were you the kid when you were 10 said, I'm going to be president of the United States one day? No. I, no. Thought, I really thought I wanted to be a journalist. Okay. Yeah, right. I thought I wanted to report the news. So this is, I'm not reporting the news. I guess I'm helping. You're create, making it. That's news, right. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people go into journalism because they care about public policy and what's right. going on in the world. So I could see how there are parallels there. So if being on the city council was so great, why did you decide to run for state representative? Well, term limits. Oh, there is that thing yeah. in Houston, right? I yeah, forget about that. Had, yeah. I think the worst term limits than any city 
is, and San Antonio had the worst, and then they changed theirs. They had two two year, and Houston had three two years. So you could only mm. serve six years. I went in with a little advantage because I'd spent four years working as a as a like a deputy mayor to Lee Brown. Right. And so I knew all all the department directors or people that I oversaw many of them. So um, it was a very easy transition. But for somebody coming in completely new to city government, mm -hmm. there's there's quite a learning curve because you've got to, you know, so many departments and you've got to learn all the functions of them. You've got to get your arms around the budget. And then your capital improvement projects that the district council members are responsible for, those are like five-year plans. Right. And most times you're not even in office when you're, sometimes even when you're breaking ground, let alone the ribbon cutting. And if you are there during a ribbon cutting, you don't know why, yeah. <laughs> right? Because you weren't yeah. there during the plan. Right, and you're getting all the, the uh, praise, and it was uh, actually the person right. for you. But one thing I was really proud of, uh, a couple of things. I got the smoking ban passed right. in Houston. And, uh, and then going back to my old neighborhood, to my childhood neighborhood, and working to get a bridge built over all those railroad tracks. I cut the ribbon on my last day of city council. Now that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And so to, to clarify for the audience, uh, you, your current Senate district, you represent the neighborhood you grew up in? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And so your district uh, comprises about 20% of Harris County, mostly kind of the East Houston mm -hmm. area, correct? So ha that's got to be a great feeling to have grown up there and now represent them in the Texas legisla legislature. It is. And last week we had uh, a lot of our mayors in. You know, uh, we have a lot of cities <laughs> within our Senate district. And I'm a big um, proponent of local control. Mm -hmm. And we have some issues coming soon, I imagine, right. that are going to impede <coughs> on local control and so I invited our mayors to come and I wanted to hear from them and their budget finance person on how some of these issues will impact them and um, we have to be mindful of that because right. I, I don't believe in overreaching overstepping you know right. we like to say to tell Washington to hey you know, mind your own yeah, business yeah. yeah we can Texas will take care of Texas well I think we need to be mindful of that too sure absolutely so in 10 years in the Texas House what would you say your biggest accomplishment was oh several things um, a couple that I'll share uh, is the was some criminal justice reform and that was the grand jury bill mm -hmm. that Senator Whitmer and I passed. Right. And I was very honored uh, to work with him on that because he is, um, you know, the the champion when it comes to criminal justice. Absolutely. Reform. And we passed the bill that allows Texas finally, where we're the last state in the country that did not have a random selection for people selected for the grand jury. Is that right? It was a, what they, it had a nickname, the pick a pal system. Oh geez, that sounds, yeah. that sounds like justice. Yeah. Yeah, and, okay. And, um, and then we passed another bill that's kind of along the lines of uh, criminal justice reform called Jenny's Law. And um, we worked on that. Uh, we worked at some stuff on sexual assault. Right. As well on college campuses. And that was coming out of the, all the, incidents and reports that started with Baylor and mm -hmm. others. So I wanted to ask you about that actually because uh, it was probably last session I had Representative Donna, Donna Howard on the show and we were talking about her legislation from 2017 to try to remove the backlog in the analysis of rape kits and I was absolutely appalled and am still appalled to yes. this day that that is such an issue and uh, there's a famous quote that I'm not going to try to try to say because I'll mess it up but if those kits are not being tested justice is being denied absolutely and you have um, people on the loose out there that should be that's right behind bars uh, we we had a bill uh, like Donna's and hers was moving faster so we um, signed up as a joint author and uh, I was 
really beside myself to hear a report on the news yet, just very recently, that this issue is still ongoing and there's still a backlog. Um, so, and the other issue that we got to, to be uh, successful in was regulating e-cigarettes mm -hmm. for minors. Right. So it seems like, you, you know, every so often you hear another story about these devices, you know, exploding or mm -hmm. burning. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's a new product. We, we don't it know is. everything there is to know about it. Right. right? So, yeah. uh, and when we passed the bill, it was, um, they were still very new. Mm -hmm. So I'm very pleased that we got that done because on a federal level, for whatever reason, they haven't been able to, to pass any type of regulation. Right. So at least here in Texas, we have. Sure. Okay. So you've gone from being one of 150 members in the House to one of 31 right. in the Senate, and you got this cool new first name, Senator, right? <laughs> um, what, what's, what's been the coolest thing, the first day you walked in there, what was the coolest thing you thought about being in the Texas Senate? There's, uh, the load, the workload is heavy. It's, you know, at least five times heavier than in the House. You serve on four standing committees, whereas in the House, you know, you might have two, you might, maybe you have, you know, two, and then a, maybe you're on calendars or something. Um, but the workload is, and you've got a lot more people that you're accountable to. Well, that's right. I was sitting with uh, folks from TxDOT today, and we were going over all the projects, and there's a ton of TxDOT work going on in mm -hmm. District 6, very significant projects um, up and down 45, and we have a lot of the industry, a lot of the, we have the Port of Houston. Right. There's a big issue with two-way vessel traffic going on there mm -hmm. that uh, we'll probably be dealing with. Um, w in my house district, I had a portion of the area that was affected by Harvey. Now in the Senate, there's a lot. Right. So that's driving a lot of my legislation this mm -hmm. session. And I'm on the Water and Rural Affairs Committee, and that's where we will hopefully adopt a statewide flood mitigation plan. Is it a little surprising, sad, that we don't already have such a plan? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. But um, <clears throat> in the House, I was chair of Urban Affairs. And so we were overseeing, or monitoring rather, the rebuilding after Harvey as it related to housing. We worked very closely with Commissioner Bush and the GLO mm -hmm. on um, <clears throat> the funding worked very closely with the city, with the county, with um, the Houston Gary Galveston Area Council. We're still working through a lot of that. But I took the committee to Corpus, and we invited officials from all the Coastal Bend area. We took the committee to um, Beaumont, mm -hmm. to Houston, because I wanted to get from a statewide perspective right. of just how severe the damage was from the hurricane and boy there's no better way than to get that a snapshot of that by being there that's right and if for example the gulf coast i mean the um coastal bend area a lot of those communities the majority of their revenues come from tourism right and so that was that was severely devastating damaged and if that's hurting, that, that eventually does impact the entire state. Right. So we're hopeful. And then, you know, out in East Texas, that's, that's also a very important part of our, uh, of our economy, a lot of the industrial area. So, uh, you know, those are big issues and, and a lot more needs to be done. And unfortunately, as, as we've talked about on the show before, with a disaster like a hurricane, once the 24 new hour news cycle stops, mm -hmm. uh, people in the rest of the state just kind of naturally forget about it, right? And yet recovering from such an, a, a historic storm takes years. It does, and we will live through the impacts for a long time. Right. Um, I know people of communities where people still aren't back in their home. Mm -hmm. um, I had concern over the health impacts. There were people that were living with 
uh, mold in their home. I had a situation on one street where a child and a senior citizen both had multiple cases of pneumonia. Oh, wow. And their homes had mold. Mm -hmm. So I, we will feel the impacts for a long time. Right. And, and we probably won't even be able to measure those adequately. Right. So there's a lot of talk this session about property taxes, appraisals, and how do we get that under control. I noticed you filed a bill uh, relating to appraisals mm -hmm. on improvements to yes. homes that were actually made because of damage from, I assume, the hurricane, right? Yeah. So t <laughs> tell me what the problem is and then what's the solution? I think our bill is a, is a good solution because we want to make sure that those repairs, the rebuilding to a home aren't considered improvements and then it affects the, uh, the uh, tax valuation. Right. So I think we'll have some good support for that. I think it's a, it's a smart bill. Sure. And um, we have a lot of interest from many people from different, uh, different areas of, of the state that are supportive of that. So that'll that's a nice way of a little relief. I mean, well, yeah, to make sure that it's that the appraisers have the tools that they need right. to make the right estimation. Sure. Yeah, because you don't want to add insult to injury. Oh. I mean, these people have already suffered well. and they've had to rebuild and now the uh, appraisers, and I, I don't want to disparage them, but they're going in and increasing the value, the right. appraised value of the homes, mm -hmm. which means that person's property oh. taxes are going it, up. It would have a huge impact. Right. I mean, we, we have to get it right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Um, one of the things that I've asked most of the guests on my show in the past couple of weeks, since we're relatively uh, fresh in this session, <laughs> right? And we have a new speaker and we're, we're having this apparent love fest, it seems <laughs> like, right? Uh, do you think that will last? I hope so. <laughs> let's, let's check in. Let's have another segment. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk in May. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, ho I hope I you're am, hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm yeah. optimistic. I'm excited about Speaker Bonin's leadership. Mm -hmm. I've served with him on a committee, and um, I, I really like his approach of his committee assignments. I was glad to see that uh, you know there are a lot of uh, people on my side of the aisle that have been promoted to sure. leadership positions. Right. And to me, it reflects the diversity of, of our state. Right. And so that means that he's mindful of that. Right. Absolutely. That's a good thing. Uh, so who's your favorite senator so far? Oh, gosh, I, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's Pat Fallon based on the conversation so far. Yeah. I mean, he's a, to, he's a funny Irishman. I mean, I, what's not to like? Yeah, though? we're both Catholic, <laughs> so we have that going. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, every, he still reminds me about that jumping ahead of him. Right. I think he took his off. Oh, yeah, he already, he, he counted his chickens before they hatched, uh, so to speak. Well, you know, I, I like talking to elected officials about the camaraderie uh, in the Texas legislature, in the House and in the Senate, especially in the Senate, because it's only 31 members, right? And I think people around the state have this perception uh, based on Washington, D.C., that the Republicans sit over here, the Democrats sit over here, they eat in different lunchrooms, but you, you all sit intermingled on the Senate floor. You hang out together in the members' lounge in the back when you're eating lunch. Right. So that, that has to be helpful, I would think. It certainly um, gets into the governing part. In Washington, I think they even have separate doors and separate cloak rooms, separate lounges. Right. Everything is separate. Right. They sit on, you know, one side. And I think you know, we've been able to to hold on to having some bipartisanship mm -hmm. because of that. And it mm -hmm. makes a difference. If you break bread with someone, you get to know them and you're less likely to, you know, go after them or right. or um, you know, try to you know, kill their bill or whatever. And I, I think it makes for a good environment where right. we, can, we can work in a bipartisan way and put the needs of Texas ahead of 
party politics. That's right. Now, that's not to say there's <laughs> some partisanship that goes on. Sure. There's definitely enough of that to go around. Right. But we're still able to be productive in a bipartisan way. Right. And there does seem to be a real focus this session on solving some major problems from school finance to property taxes. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of health care pressures as well that I know you're working on. And so hopefully we can, you all can get some good things done this session. I think so. I was pleased to, um, to hear the governor's state of the state and he included some emergency items that I, I think are very worthy. Right. Um, especially on on school finance, mm -hmm. and I, I think our two chairman, uh, Larry Taylor and uh, Dan Huberty, I know they're really working hard to, to make this right. Right. And I, a lot of people are counting on us. That's right. Well, Senator, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. And, and we will have you back in May, and we'll see yeah. if the wheels have fallen right. off. Hopefully they haven't. Um, I might not be so fresh by then. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, as you know, we like to close each episode with some words of wisdom from our special guests. Sometimes uh, that's a, a song lyric or a quote from someone famous, or if you just got something brilliant you want to share with the audience today, I, please do. What keeps me grounded, Trey, is I never forget my roots, where I came from. Good. Yeah, that's important. Very important. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank we'll you have you back. Me. And thank you all for watching. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, and your favorite podcast app. Thank you, and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.